incredible panel and kind of some general housekeeping things that I'm going to go through that is okay for those uh, folks that are coming in a little later. Um, but thank you so much for being here this evening. Uh, I'm going to ask all attendees, unless you are a, a panelist, to please mute yourself at this time. Um, we've also received incredible response um, from this event, and our panelists have allowed this session to be recorded. My name is Gracie Simmendinger, and I am the president of Downtown Council. For those of you that are new to Downtown Council, I um, just want to share some brief information about our group. We are one of eight chamber councils, and simply put, Downtown Council cares about the future of our city. We represent Jacksonville's business community, including major corporations, growing businesses, and startups. Our goal is to connect one another so that downtown and greater Jacksonville will thrive and prosper. We also pride ourselves on keeping you informed of local business and civic issues by bringing top tier speakers to our meetings. As you may know, tonight's session is the third iteration of discussions on race and specific areas of focus within our community. Our first panel was held last July, centered on race and its economic effects on Jacksonville. And the second panel was held in September with a focus on race and its impact on education. Tonight's host, um, a dis tonight we're hosting a discussion on race and its effects on health and more specifically on health equity and how it's not just simply about healthcare. We are thrilled to partner with fellow downtown council member, uh, Anne-Marie Knight to bring this important conversation to light. We hope that you will walk away from this evening with a greater understanding of the current health outcomes for Jacksonville residents and the why behind those statistics, what's currently being done to combat our local health disparities and why it's good for business, what success looks like and ways that you can be a part of it. I also want to thank Downtown Council Board Member Benjamin Alcorn for all of his help in planning this event and for agreeing to moderate the discussion. I want to thank the Chamber's Health Council for agreeing to partner with us. We truly can't think of a better council to be involved. And lastly, I want to, big, to give a big thank you to the Chamber for providing us the opportunity to have this important discussion. At this time, I will briefly introduce all five panelists who have joined us this evening. First up is Mr. David Garfunkel. David serves as the president of Lift Jacks, an initiative of business and community leaders working to eradicate generational poverty in Jacksonville. Some may refer to the nonprofit Lift Jacks as the community quarterback because of its driving force behind the community revitalization initiative in Jacksonville's east side neighborhood in partnership with resident leaders. Prior to joining Lift Jacks, David worked for five years at FSG, a nonprofit consulting firm focused on finding new ways to address or to advance social change. David developed expertise in collective impact, which is a structured approach that brings together community leaders across sectors to work on solving challenges in their communities. David also started his career as a Peace Corps volunteer at the Dominican Republic, where he served for three years in the area of community economic development. Welcome, David. Our next, panelist, our next panelist is uh, Ms. Kelly O'Leary. Kelly is the Vice President of Engagement for the Jacksonville Transportation Authority. She is responsible for key initiatives around both employee and customer engagement. Kelly spearheaded the launch of the JTA University in support of JTA's workforce development initiatives. Prior to joining JTA, Kelly was an appointed official of both Mayor Alvin Brown and Mayor Lenny Curry selected as a key member of the leadership team charged to head the Employee Services Department for the city with a population of over 8,000 employees. She was named an Ultimate HR Executive in 2010, one of Jacksonville Business Journal's 40 Under 40 in 2011, and is currently a member of the Leadership Jacksonville Class of 2021. We are excited to have you, Kelly. Ms. Shannon Nasworth. Shannon has been the president and CEO of Ability Housing for nearly two decades. Ability Housing's vision is a society where housing is a right, not a privilege, and all individuals have safe, affordable housing in vibrant communities. Prior to her work at Ability Housing, Shannon has also held executive positions with Habitat for Humanities, International Headquarters, and its local affiliates. 
Shannon currently serves as the chair of the State of Florida Council on Homelessness, in addition to serving on various other state and national committees. Last year, she earned national recognition as Executive of the Year in the Multifamily Executive Magazine. Thank you for being here, Shannon. Mr. Jeff Sheffield. Jeff is the Executive Director of the North Florida Transportation Planning Organization. The North Florida TPO works as an independent organization handling transportation planning and prioritizing within its four county region. Working with partner agencies, he has championed results-oriented investment in intelligent transformation systems, traffic incident management, safety, bicycle and pedestrian planning, freight and logistics planning, clean fuels, and multimodal mobility improvements. Most recently, Jeff has focused his time on implementing the TPO's Smart North Florida initiative by harnessing the power of smart technologies, coordinated data, and regional collaboration to improve North Florida's economic competitiveness, sustainability, and quality of life. Jeff also recently gave a TEDx talk titled The Pulse Behind a City, uh, excuse me, The Pulse Behind a Smart City. Welcome, Jeff. Ms. Anne-Marie Knight. Anne-Marie serves as the Vice President of Community Engagement and the Chief Diversity Officer for UF Health Jacksonville. She has over 20 years of progressive healthcare experience in the areas of strategic planning and operations management. In addition, Anne-Marie also serves 24 years in the Navy. She serves as a regent for the American College of Healthcare Executives and is a board member of the Women's Giving Alliance among other board positions. Anne-Marie has received numerous awards, including the Veteran of Influence, Woman of Distinction, Woman with Heart, and also military decorations during her service. As I mentioned earlier, tonight's program would not be possible without Anne-Marie. She took an idea we had, ran with it, and has really brought it to fruition, and we are so grateful. At this time, I'm going to turn it over to Anne-Marie to provide a general overview and initial starting point before we all dive in together. Anne-Marie, take it away. Thank you, Gracie. Um, welcome, everyone. And before we get started, uh, one of our colleagues isn't with us this evening, and I just wanted to draw that to your attention. It's, it's unfortunate that Suzanne Pickett couldn't join us, so just keep her in your thoughts, if you would, please. So I'm going to share my screen. I believe everyone should be able to see it. So, you know, for those outside of healthcare, because I see many of my colleagues on the line, we know it's, it's difficult to imagine, how could you say that health equity isn't all about healthcare, okay? So what we're saying here is that health is informed by more factors outside of our hospital systems than within those walls. The American Hospital Association's societal factors uh, created a framework of societal factors that influence health. And there's three primary components, systematic causes, which are the fundamental causes of social inequities that lead to poor health, community causes, which are the underlying social and economic conditions that influence people's ability to be healthy. We'll talk more about that in a little bit. And then finally, the person themselves. This is a category of social needs, individuals, non-medical, social or economic circumstances that hinder their own ability to stay healthy and or recover from illness. So it's only natural then to say health equity isn't simply about health care. So of course we have to start with the definitions. Um, and before we jump right into the definitions, I'm not gonna read in detail them to you, but in the center of your screen, you see two images. One at the top is equality and the bottom one is equity. We know from the basic layman's definition, equality is not equity and vice versa, right? At the top of that, uh, that infograph, you'll see that a bicycle, the same bicycle is given to each person, but each person can't navigate that bicycle in the same manner. So that's equality. Give me exactly what you give David, but maybe I don't have the same skills as David to use that bicycle. Equity would be to find the bicycle that best fits me. 
fight. So the Centers for Disease Control defines health equity as being achieved when every person has the opportunity to attain his or her full health potential and no one is at a disadvantage. It really requires removing obstacles to health, such as poverty, discrimination, and their consequences, including powerless, powerlessness and lack of access to good jobs with fair pay. So if you walk away with nothing else, if you didn't know that before, equality and equity are, cannot be used in the same vein. We can't achieve the health outcomes we want to achieve without addressing equity. So let's get to the root of the matter, right? So why do we have health inequities? We have to really um, be frank about the fact that they stem from something. And those some things um, in, in our example today are structural racism and institutional racism. What's the real difference, right? So structural racism is the distribution of resources and power in a society with the intent to exclude. It is intentional. It is designed to, you know, take away a resource from a group. And in this case, it's marginalizing people of color, okay? Institutional racism um, is, was coined in 1967, so a little while ago, in a book called Black Power, The Politics of Liberation. The authors wrote that while individual racism is often identifiable because of its overt nature, institutional racism is less perceptible because of its less overt, far more subtle nature. Institutional racism, in their terms, originates in the operation of established and respected forces in the society and thus receives far less public condemnation. This is how status quo happens, right? So, you know, structural racism and institutional racism are at the core, and there's lots of work to be had in those spaces amongst our community, our region, our nation, and the like. And it's really at the root of what we need to modify and move to get to health equity. But that's the root. You've also heard about the term health disparities. And I want you to be mindful not to interchange health equity or equality with health disparities. Because while structural racism and institutional racism may be at the root, the branches and the leaves of health inequity results in health disparities. So what you see on your slide there is a chart. It doesn't represent Jacksonville. It is a national data. It's looking at chronic disease as a whole by race and ethnicity. And you see it jumps right out in the middle that when it comes to African-Americans health, we are the most disadvantaged nationally. So health disparities are preventable differences in the burden of disease when it's, um, well, excuse me, in the burden of disease, injury, violence, and opportunities for, to achieve optimal health. So that's the backdrop. That's the backdrop of what we're gonna talk to you a little bit about today. Many of us have seen this slide. And normally when we talk about life expectancy, we talk about, you know, let's look at how long you can live. Well, I'm gonna just flip it and be very more, a little bit more direct. Where you live is gonna dictate when you die, period. That period at the end of that sentence up top is intentional. It's a common slide used, but what, look, look at our area of downtown. Between uh, just around where I'm sitting today in Springfield and at the campus of U of Health to San Marco, there is a 17 year difference in life expectancy. I've also, just in case you live in any of these other communities, I've included some others for you to take a glimpse. And one of my colleagues will drop in the chat here shortly, um, some data resources for you to look up um, your particular communities. Does it feel good? Now it may feel good to you that your, your community's life expectancy is 78, but how do you feel about the rest of our community not having the same advantage as you do? That is what we as a community have to work on. So life expectancy is influenced by many things. 80%, um, excuse me, American Hospital Association has identified that 80% of the factors 
actually come from outside of health. So 40% because of socioeconomic factors, physical environment, the health behaviors, and then healthcare falls in about 20%. As you scan this slide, I'm sure you can think about where your business lies, um, where your interest lies, and where your community lies in your, in your uh, respective area of town. So when I think about where I am physically sitting today, I understand that there's higher proponents of violence, there's um, less transportation, housing is a bit more challenged, employment is more challenged. And so these are all of the things that Im impact um, uh, health uh, disparities and, um, uh, and equity in health in general. So what influences health equity itself? I really liked this particular chart that you see on the top left. It was convened by the Institution for Healthcare Improvement. It's the 100 Million Healthier Lives in Initiatives. It was 2017 and it was supposed to wrap up by 2020 with 100 million people living healthier lives. Couldn't find the data if they were successful or not. But what I did like about it was their three-tier focus. They were focused on recognition that it is not possible to achieve health outcomes we seek without addressing equity, number one. Number two was a recognition of the tremendous waste of talent we have amongst our community when we don't address inequities. And the final was a belief in our interconnectedness, uh, common opportunity and destiny. So what their thoughts were, that if we don't connect better, if we don't allow everyone to reach their fullest potential as a community, we will never have health equity and we will never be at the best we can be as a community. So it's interesting, I kind of took this same chart they have on the screen and tried to drop a couple of initiatives that I'm aware of. This is not all inclusive of um, our bright spots in Jacksonville, but by no means, um, am I saying our bright spots are enough? Um, they're just a little bit of a glimpse on some of the initiatives going on in our community and longstanding uh, organizations that are making a difference in the community. So we know the primary drivers, as I described in the last slide, are around poverty, low social economic status, racism, trauma, stigma. Um, in the secondary drivers, we've all heard, my partner, I see many of my partners on the line, the Jacksonville Nonprofit Hospital Partnership. We, every three years, come at you with a community health needs assessment. We will be bringing it to you this spring or, or early summer. And we talk to you about the health disparities of our community. So we've seen the, the references to the disparities in the urban core, mental illness, addiction, racism, maybe not racism in the report, veteran status, poor access to housing and education. Those are all the drivers. But look at the bottom right of the screen and you'll see, I think, initiatives that are making a difference and amongst others. So I guess if I were to leave you at this point in getting ready for our colleagues, I would say, though we have a long way to go, I think we have to be proud of the initiatives that are underway and proud of the fact that you're here to talk about this. And I suspect that means you are all in. So I look forward to talking on, on the back end of this conversation. Thank you. Ben. Thank you, Anne-Marie. Thank you, Gracie, for getting us started. Um, this information is sobering. Um, the statistics are scary and in a very, very short distance. And we appreciate you sharing uh, the definitions. I'm sure some of these definitions will come up uh, a little bit later in our discussion. Uh, now turning back to a little bit of housekeeping um, before we turn it over to the subject matter uh, experts, um, many questions are going to uh, arise. Please use the chat function um, please don't direct message uh, to me as I'm going to be focusing on some other things and uh, some of my teammates will be putting the questions together. If you feel like you do need to direct message anybody, please uh, use Gracie Simmendinger. Um, but we will get to questions a little bit later once we get through some of the information. I also uh, do want to make sure that I uh, let you know again that this is being recorded so that we can uh, use uh, this information uh, at, at a later date. 
So let's dive right in. Um, we're going to go to Shannon Asworth uh, first. Now, Shannon, the statistics Anne Marie shared are, are, are shocking, but numbers don't tell the whole story. Um, can you share with us a story uh, of your experiences uh, with these these numbers? Uh, and can you also share the role affordable housing has on, on health com uh, outcomes? Sure. So thank you for the opportunity. And I, honestly, when I was asked to share a story, I was overwhelmed by the number of people I know that really are in desperate need of an affordable place to live and the impacts it has on its health. I remember the day I met a woman moving into our apartments and she was getting kidney dialysis and after treatment going to sleep in her car. And we were thrilled to be able to move her into an apartment so she could recuperate after a very difficult process. But just to kind of really explain all this, the breadth of uh, how impactful housing is, I'll talk about one couple. Uh, so a few years ago, the community got together and we identified the 100 people most at risk of dying on our streets if we didn't get them housed. And one, uh, two of the top 10 were a couple named LaShawn and Petra. They had been living on the streets for over three years. Uh, LaShawn had donated a kidney to a family member and had post-surgery complications. And Petra had a litany of medical conditions, chronic diseases. She was in and out of the hospital endlessly. And LaShawn would not sleep at night so that he could stay awake and protect Petra while they were on the streets. We were able to get them into one of our apartments and uh, we asked them if we could get the health data from before they moved into the housing and compare it to afterwards. And in the year before moving into housing, Petra alone had spent $1.1 million in healthcare. And the year after moving into our apartment, she was to the hospital one time. In addition, on the personal level, I can tell you the day after they moved into the housing, LaShawn had to come by our office to sign some forms. And I, to this day, will always remember sitting in my office and hearing the receptionist out front going, Sean, you look so different. And his response was, yeah, I got to sleep last night. And I walked out and the physical transformation was astounding. I mean, literally one night's sleep and the knowledge that he could lock the door, they could put medicine in the refrigerator, they could have their savings, that they had their, you know, they could put their things in safe places and that they were safe made a complete physical transformation on him. It was, it was completely remarkable. And so that's just one example of how important it is to have a safe place to live. But housing really has a lot of impacts on health. As Anne-Marie was saying, social determinants of health really are the prime driver of our health outcomes. And place is one of the biggest drivers of that. Where you live really impacts your health. And your housing is a, a key co component of that. So affordable, quality affordable housing is needed because when people don't have a quality of place they can afford, they either rent substandard housing because it's all they can afford. So they're living in unsafe environments with unsafe housing, maybe like the, you know, the electrical, there's mold, there's other infestations, all sorts of things that are very terrible for your health, very um, negative impacts on asthma and other chronic conditions, especially for the kids, or they're spending more than they can afford on the housing. And there are multiple studies showing us what the impacts of that are. Harvard did in a study, and if a family is severely cost burdened, paying more than 50% of their household income for housing, they will spend 75% less on healthcare than persons living in an affordable place, 75%. There's another study that said, looked at low-income households, one group living in a place they could afford, another group not. The infants in those households were 43% less visits to the hospital than the children who were living in an affordable place to live. Primary health care visits go up 20% and emergency room utilization goes down 18%. It's Ability Housing, a few years ago, worked with the state. We did a pilot um, working with ACA, the Agency for Healthcare Administration, the Department of Children and Families, and our state housing finance agency. Working with uh, the hospitals, the service providers, the sheriff's office, we identify the people who are cycling through our costly systems of care, move them into a place to live, and then had a, a group called Health Tech do an analysis, comparing the two years before they moved into housing with the two years after they moved into housing. It cost us collectively as a community 30% less, including the cost of housing and services, to provide them a place to live than it had been to maintain their homelessness in the two years prior to they moved into housing. And the biggest cost saver was hospitalizations. Our health hospitals saved 58%. 
And there's a myth that people go to the hospitals to get out of the rain or because it's cold. That's not true. They're not being admitted into the hospital because they need a place to sleep at night. They're being admitted because they have serious medical conditions. And they stay for a day or two, they stabilize, and then they get released back to the streets. And it's an endless cycle. Their health never improves. It only goes down. And the hospitals are doing the best they can, but they can't create housing for these individuals. And they try very hard. We all work together to try very hard. So it's, it is incredibly important that everybody have a safe place they can afford to live. The toxic stress associated with always being afraid that you won't make the rent that month really has physical ramifications to our long-term health. And the kids notice, they really do know when their family is at risk. And I can, the, so one of the greatest parts of my job is the day I get to see a family move into a nice new apartment. And just the look on the kids' faces, even if they have next to nothing, they're moving into a place that is safe, it's theirs, and they know they're gonna be able to stay. And the look of relief on the parents' faces you can just feel the stress ebb out of their body. And they have the opportunity to take a breath, to get their kids stabilized, get themselves stabilized. All of the stress associated with either trying to make the rent at the place they couldn't afford or trying to keep their kids safe in a place that wasn't safe because it was all they could afford. Or in the worst case scenario, they are homeless and they're trying their best to keep their children or themselves safe. This, the release of stress when they get to walk into that apartment has monumental physical impacts and has long lasting impacts on their health outcomes. And I think it's really important that everybody remember how Maslow's hierarchy is very true. Housing and food, those are the two things we need. Everything else, you know, is plus. If you don't have housing and food, the rest of your life is just spent making sure you have housing and food. You're not gonna take care of your health. You're not gonna take care of many other things in your, um, in your life. And so it's, it's just so critically important. And another component that people don't necessarily think about with regards to health outcomes and affordable housing is there's also, and unfortunately in the last year, we're sure this has increased due to COVID and the challenges associated with it. Domestic violence is a major concern. And there are a lot of women who will stay in a very bad situation because they don't have anywhere else to go. They don't want their children to be homeless or they can't afford housing. So they will stay in a very unsafe environment. And obviously that has drastic impacts on their health, their children's health, mental health, behavior health, physical health. Um, so everybody needs to have a, a place they can afford that is home. It doesn't have to be fancy but it needs to be safe. It needs to be a good place to live. And it really matters to all of us because if kids aren't healthy, they're not gonna do well in school. If parents aren't healthy, they're not gonna have good jobs. They're not gonna be good employees. They're gonna be out sick. They're gonna be taking care of sick kids. You know, it, it just compounds itself. But if we can give people that foundation, food and shelter, food and a place to live, then everything else can be built and grown and all of us collectively will be in such a better place. And I hope that was what you wanted. <laughs> no, that was, that was great, Shannon. Um, thank you so much. I'm, I'm, I'm actually going to, while we're on this topic, I'm going to bring David Garfunkel in if I could um, with Lyft Jackson and they, they've been focusing on, on the East side neighborhood. Can you talk about affordable housing and, and, and the health impacts in that, in that neighborhood? Uh, I can to some extent, but uh, Shannon is uh, the person I respect most uh, in the city when it comes to talking about affordable housing um, with Ability Housing and is a close partner of ours. Um, I, I think what I would build on there is just to emphasize one, one thing, which is that place matters. Place matters. And the foundational anchor of place for families is the home. And so that's why quality affordable housing is so important for the litany of reasons that, that Shannon uh, mentioned. You know, whether that's, uh, you know, if you're living in substandard housing and being exposed to lead or asthma triggers, and we know that asthma is one of the leading causes of uh, absence from school, uh, domestic violence, mental health stressors. So 
place matters and the home matters. And when we're looking at uh, a neighborhood such as the east side, we see uh, certainly multifamily uh, units that um, some of the most challenged uh, multifamily apartments in uh, the city, also single family, uh, some of the, the most challenged uh, single family stock when you walk into these homes, um, you would be Again, if you want to talk, you want to talk uh, di uh, disparities by mileage, and you you know look at some of the wonderful homes we have and some of the nicest neighborhoods we have in Jacksonville. And you know, five miles away, you're going to walk into a home and see uh, holes in the floor. Um, and so uh, it's you know not all to be doom and gloom. There's there's also you know very uh, there are families that are doing well in these neighborhoods as well. But place matters and homes matter. Um, but just to expand just a little bit on the place, and but I and not to take too much on time. The home is the foundation, but then the built environment around the home. Uh, you know, we know that lack of sidewalks, lack of bike paths, lack of recreational areas uh, in our neighborhoods discourage physical physical activity. It contributes to obesity. Um, the threat of crime, sometimes that is related to this, keeps people inside their homes. Income segregate, segregation is linked with obesity, with mental health outcomes. Lack of supermarkets and, and access to healthy food in these neighborhoods has detrimental effects. So that's why we focus um, at the neighborhood level. And that's why we focus um, really at this, this foundational idea of place. Uh, but to everything that Shannon said, it really starts with the home. Thanks, David. I appreciate that. I mean, place obviously does matter. I mean, to some of the statistics Anne-Marie was talking about what are you know what are the some of the the largest causes of those those huge gaps I mean it's it's heart disease it's diabetes it's it's um, you know the place getting out having sidewalks having access those things matter uh, a great deal um, but it, I'm going to turn this over to Kelly here in a second Kelly you know place matters but then also mobility matters and and being able to get to um, get access uh, and, and remove the barriers of access to healthcare. Uh, can you talk about some of the initiatives in, in, in public transportation to be able to address that? Yeah, absolutely. And um, Shannon and David just knocked it out of the park in, in terms of you know, setting up um, you know, that story and, and the impact on our community. And I think the key word is access. Um, you know, that is ease of access, it is um, travel time. Um, all too often, individuals in certain areas of our community are um, up against um, getting to work on time, service reliability, um, being able to transport their children, and that adds another level of stress. So you talk about place, right, David? Um, you talk about a, a stable um, living environment, but the stress of being able to get to work, to and from work, um, adds another layer. Um, you know, I, I see it from the customer perspective. 50% um, of my oversight is community engagement, customer engagement, and hearing, you know, about our transit dependent population and how can the JTA support that. And we're doing that outside of just not just fixed routes or your 40 foot bus going along bus route services, but being very innovative and very intentional in how we support initiatives around health. So our Ride to Health program that we just launched um, in support of our Vaccine Transportation Task Force to make sure access to vaccination is equitable amongst all of the areas of our community. We quickly learned that the Northwest side of Jacksonville was underserved in terms of having vaccine availability, or access to transit sites in order to get to those particular locations. And so we stood up expanded ready ride services that were on-demand services, free to our seniors 65 and up, free to our healthcare workers to get them to the vaccination sites. Um, we've supported initiatives on the north side as it relates to our door-to-store -door program so that individuals have free access from their door to their store in order to get healthy food at seven different locations um, within that, that location. Um, that's a pilot, that's an expandable um, initiative to be able to um, address some of these um, health inequities. And then at our, our new Jacksonville Regional Transportation System, we have a fresh farm produce market um, that is supported by Abundant Harvest, which is a minority owned fresh farm 
um, business and we've got the ability for individuals, our customers to access healthy foods um, at our centralized location. And so, you know, I think it's, you know, a, a very good point in terms of access, but, but really being innovative and thinking outside of the box in terms of just tr traditional transit. Sure. Uh, let me kind of ask a follow-up and maybe bring Anne Marie in, in on this as well. Um, obviously, you're working on very creative things to be able to get people uh, access. How does that information get out to the community um, that these type of things are available um, so that we can, you know, utilize uh, all the things that the JTA is doing. And Anne Marie, if you wouldn't mind jumping in after Kelly on this as well. Sure. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, we, we've stood up um, health.jtafla.com, which is an accessible website to announce all of the access points that you can have in order to get to these vaccine sites. We're working with our senior living facilities and doing travel training initiatives so they can learn how to use JTA services. Obviously, through our social media, um, through our efforts um, with our community outreach, I have outreach coordinators that are out and about um, our community and teaching individuals how to ride JTA efficiently. Um, and then obviously, um, you know, through partnerships with our community, our community, um, you know, uh, partners, we're, we're always engaged um, with all of those different um, avenues to be able to really kind of push this message out. Um, and I think there's an opportunity um, for further connection with private industry and making sure that employers seek to understand um, their employees' challenges around transportation and that they're empathetic and listen and, and provide support in terms of how they can collaborate together for solutions to support their employees. Thanks, Kelly. Anne Marie? So, you know, Kelly and I have become new best friends. Um, in healthcare, what's one of our biggest barriers for our most underserved um, and vulnerable members of the community is getting to the appointment, right? So, you know, when we think at UF Health that we have over 100,000 visits a year, it's an easy thing to post information, to share Kelly's flyers and say, remember, JTA has resources. I mean, I was taken aback when I learned about ReadyRide and that's where we started talking about a little bit about the vaccine. So do you know if you're over 65 in certain communities and it's not limited, um, Kelly, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not limited to the North side, there are um, zones but if you're over 65 and live in one of these zones, you can get to wherever you need to go for free. So of course, we're gonna make sure that our patients know this information. It is a twofold benefit. We don't want them to have that stress to worry about how to get to us. And we want them to get to us. We wanna be sure that we can help them with their health needs. So programs like that with JTA are critical um, uh, in, in, in all of our hospitals, but particularly as I think about our uh, uninsured population that we serve at UF Health. Thanks, Anne Marie. I'm going to go over to Jeff. He's got his hands raised. Yeah. He wants to he wants to jump in, and then yeah. Anne Marie, I'll probably come come right back to you. I know okay. I'm wearing the hat today for later as Smart North Florida, but obviously as a transportation organization, and to kind of compliment on on what Kelly's talking about and and add something to it, just in the overall challenge going forward. One of the activities, and some of you are participating in, we're working on a mobility for the underserved plan. And, and through that exercise, it's the realization that to go along with all the services JTA is providing, there are a myriad of private companies providing services. There's United Way with Lyft. There's all these different aspects. And, and when Anne Marie talks about needing to give a flyer to a patient or whatever, if if every one of those possibilities aren't provided to that patient, they don't even know those other potential modes are there. And so I think um, I'm, I'm teeing up my comments later, but I think in the area of really being able to leverage um, opportunity in our region is, is really how do you flip that script? So the patient isn't obligated to find those programs or hope that Anne Marie gives it to them um, that they could opt into some kind of an app or system that instead connects their need to all of the providers. So if Kelly has a grant or a program or a service that fits the niche of that particular patient, they can simply call them immediately and deal with it. If the other private entities are United Way, it fits the 
profile of the funding, then they can, they can call it and you relieve, relieve the burden of that individual. So that's just a, a big bold idea that, that we'll talk about. And then the second piece to, to David on the physical infrastructure, uh, that's one of the things we're dealing with now is in the, in, this, in the spirit of equity, transportation equity is very, very uh, prominent right now in our, in our webinars and training sessions because it's the realization again that in those communities, you know, we're in the business of moving people and most of those traditional investments to widen a road or put in sidewalks are in areas that have high demands because that's the idea. It needs wider roads, it needs more infrastructure. And so these neighborhoods don't get the attention. And so in the transportation equity concept, it's really trying to modify or, or add additional criteria when you're an organization like mine that's trying to prioritize federal funding for a four county region, placing emphasis on these underserved communities so that from a health equity standpoint, it's the active living by design concept. So having a sidewalk, having quality light, street lights, having the infrastructure that enables them to, to frankly move around means they become healthier and they don't show up to Anne-Marie's hospital as much um, in that context. So it, it does all fit. And, and I kind of see that from a transportation perspective of that would be um, sort of our niche in that. So really Thanks, quickly, Jeff. Ben, one of the things that I think is really critical about what Jeff said, and, and as, as we think about all of this is taking the control out of our hands and giving it to our citizens and residents who don't have the resources. I think, Jeff, you're spot on. We have to find a way um, to make sure that they're in the driver's seat, if I may, um, rather than us. So, ben. Yeah, it's, the, it's a whole paradigm shift too in the theme of it. It's, it's transportation as a service is the concept now that, that's out there. So it is the notion that you're an individual that needs to go from A to B. Ideally, you're saying, I need to go from A to B and now it will populate with every potential option you have. You can ride a bike and it'll take you this long. You can call an Uber and it will cost you this. You can, you can call on JTA and this is what, what it will be. And you have all the options in front of you as a service and you don't have to belabor um, those thought processes and you choose what fits your scale. And, that's in, and you get those opportunities presented to you. All right, Ben, take it back. You know, transportation is a huge topic. It, we it is. Out of time there. We could. Yeah, don't get me started. Yeah, I'm we'll not come, here for that anyway, right? Yeah, I we'll, think Jeff and I could take up the entire hour and a half. <laughs> we were talking about that earlier. Each different segment could probably do an hour and a half. Uh, but I do want to jump back, actually, right back to you, Anne Marie. Uh, one of the things that I, you know, have been hearing about um, is the Urban Health Alliance, mm. and. I don't think a lot of people probably know a lot about that yet. And I know it's something that you are working very, very hard on. Could you spend some time talking about that? That's why I wanted you to take back from transportation. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I didn't realize that was this. Nice. So the Urban Health Alliance is an initiative that UF Health has embarked on. So everyone in this room or this cube room understands and know that UF Health um, embraces its mission to take care of uninsured through city contract, right? Um, so we have approximately 6,000 patients who come to us and um, get their care and they are uninsured. And it is truly the only model that is primary care, specialty care, surgical care, wraparound services for these patients. And actually, if we spend some time, the data of their health outcomes is amazing because of this work. So um, my colleague, Dr. Ross Jones, who leads the total care clinics, and that's at Brentwood, EG Means Clinic off of the MLK Highway, our old VA building, and a couple of um, uh, uh, clinics in, in the Sutel area, wellness centers. He's been leading this work for years, and he just got tired of it. He said, you know, all I'm doing is treating the disease. It's exactly what we thought about in those last couple of slides. So he embarked on an effort, which is now coined the Urban Health Alliance. And it's the idea and focus of to improve the health of residents through a multi-sector social determinants focused evidence-based approach to health and well-being. 
basically what I'm saying is we're going beyond health. It's beyond health. I'm gonna start from the right side of that slide and take you to the left. And so under the policy arm, it's the idea, again, as I alluded a little bit on the transportation talk is, you know, what policies do we wanna see change? Remember we talked briefly about structural and institutional racism. So let's say there's a policy that is negatively impacting a population or a community. Um, and they come and they form a team of people that want to work on a policy. We are going to work alongside them, help them develop those briefing documents, help them address these issues um, so they can feel empowered to address the needs of their community. That's one aspect. You know we're an academic medical center. I'd be remiss not mentioning that. Um, so research is our gig, right? So we are going to continue to be very laser focused around health and equity research. Um, we've done health disparities research. We've been there, done that, right? We're all doing that. But now we're really gonna focus and be a bit more intentional around health equity um, in our research outlook. On the ed education standpoint, nope, we're not building a high school. We, we love our neighbors, Darnell Cookman Middle and High School across the street. But what we wanna do is build an academy of health resources to educate the community or increase their education around certain health topics. We also are creating our own community health worker models so that way we can deploy colleagues into the community to help us reach um, and touch the community uh, more intimately. The very last item there is services. So this is uh, what I call my pet project. This is the piece that you're gonna see the most easiest, hopefully in the next 60 days. Um, in addition to providing the care itself, we all have the ability, we have the ability to go in our electronic medical record to ask patients specifically about the social determinants of health. Remember that really busy chart that had information about jobs and education and so forth. Well, we have the ability now to ask that question. So for our 6,000 patients in the total care clinic, we have been really um, elevating that question with them so we can have some data on who's food insecure, who are looking for jobs and the like. And so our services model is two pronged. We are opening what we're calling the social services hub. And in that space, uh, a patient who is referred by their provider and has been identified that they have a social need, they will be referred to the space to connect with partners. Now, it's not novel. Um, it's not new partners. It's some of the same people that are on this call and other agencies that are going to connect. Now, this was all pre pre-COVID. So we were excited about our Jetson model that we were going to have or that we will have partially in person and partially virtual, just like what we're doing now. You know, a year ago, doing the Zoom thing was unheard of. And so we planned and still plan to have a model where they can connect with resources virtually. Um, uh, uh, Jeff, I want an app. I definitely want an app for that. But our focus is really to be partnered with them. So think about the fact that who else has data around a patient's well-being and their social determinants. And so now it's our opportunity to say, you know what? While we address the health piece, our partners are addressing the social needs and let's see how we can move this needle. So that's the social services hub. Attached to this hub is gonna be a, what we call a food pharmacy. So prescriptive nutrition. So I'll just pick my name for comfort's sake. Let's say Anne-Marie sees Dr. Jones. Anne-Marie has diabetes and, and uh, high cholesterol for years. Dr. Jones now is asking Anne-Marie, okay, what do you want to do? How are you doing? And she describes that um, she doesn't have the physical ability and or the access to get to that grocery store, which is two miles away, right? So Dr. Jones will write a prescription. She will become part of this food pharmacies program through a dietitian with the education and have access to food, fresh fruits and vegetables in our pantry. Um, this is a, a great opportunity that we've been funded by our colleagues at Florida Blue, and we're partnering with Feeding Northeast Florida and other food par partners in the community. And we will be able to measure how that nutrition, how that education, and how our engagement with these patients um, uh, hopefully improves their circumstance. 
We can't keep talking about the social determinants as a silo in treating health separately. And we're exciting that we're gonna do this work for this particular population of patients um, as we move forward. So more to come on that and happy to share more as anyone may want to know more or help. To Thank you for letting me share that. Ben. Yeah, thanks, Amory. That's, I don't know how you find time to do all the stuff you do, um, to be perfectly honest. Um, but I do want to. I do want to shift. I, I mean, I want to. I want to hear more about that. I'm sure there'll be some questions on that as well. But I, I do want to shift a little bit um, to sort of a, a different um, kind of thing. And I'm, I'm going to bring Jeff back in. Um, when Jeff and I first started talking, I, I I I called him and I was like, "Hey, Jeff, what's what's your role in this in this conversation? What is you know North Florida TPO and Smart North Florida? How how does that connect to this discussion about health. Um, and uh, uh, Jeff said, he's like, I'm not quite sure. No, I am. He, he, had, he actually had ideas. And I was like, okay, that makes perfect sense. But stuff that I didn't think about. So I kind of want to go in a little bit different direction and turn it over to Jeff and, and ask, um, you know, what is the tech piece and, and how does Smart North Florida play into this? Yeah, Ben, it's been a crazy ride. And, and I, this is so atypical frankly, outside of the transportation conversation, so atypical for me to be hanging out with uh, these types of groups. Um, and this has really been what's been happening now for over two years, just really amazing uh, sectors finding their way into the space. So to share a little bit about Smart North Florida and then why it kind of all fits in this big picture. Uh, again, transportation planning organization, funding roads, doing traditional transportation, um, but the evolution to the term familiar with most today and called smart cities, um, really, really behind that uh, is the notion of, of data analytics, predictive analytics, the ability to develop metrics and understand uh, better in depth the community challenges that we might have. So for us, it started in transportation. Uh, it's been our efforts to deploy all kinds of technology from cameras to sensor controllers on the road and the ability of collecting all that data and become better at what we do. Um, from that, it really evolved uh, very quickly to an initiative much larger and on a regional scale of the realization that that, that conversation of the ability to bring together data and information, understand the depth of the problem and be more comprehensive in the solution is a universal conversation. Whether you're talking healthcare, economic development, uh, education, uh, ladders of opportunity, transportation, you name it, it's very universal today under that smart city notion. And so we, we founded an initiative called Smart North Florida, um, really built off of three pillars. Smart technology, which is the cool toys we put out, whether you're in transportation or any other, putting out physical infrastructure that's applicable to whatever we're doing, and then taking that data and information and making it useful. The second pillar is the premise of what we've defined really as a true smart community, and that is an open cloud-based data exchange. So to Anne Marie's point, not having to go seek different sectors and ask for information an open exchange that all sectors and partners are sharing raw data. So we have the ability to draw metrics for our own roles in our own sectors. And so that piece was there. And then the third pillar was regional coordination, not the traditional partnerships of just public sector, um, the realization of private sector coming into it, but really what resonated and, and happened over organically was this realization of a tech community uh, entrepreneurial and startup sector in Northeast Florida that many don't know exists. And these are really the change agents of today. The ones that are able to take information, turn it into an amazing story, and then develop apps or products from it that are solving whatever that challenge is. And the twofold to that is the solution created and a marketable tool that these startups are able to sell and and, and work throughout the country and grow within. So it was built off of that notion. Um, very quickly, the idea of that cloud-based started connecting everywhere. So the nonprofits were coming in, Anne Marie's calling, others are calling, uh, Beth is calling, or Melanie's calling from Baptist, 
Um, it, everyone's calling it has nothing to do with the TPO. It has the, to do with the premise of this breaking down silos and sharing of information. And I think that's the piece that seemed to grab. And once that happened, um, it left us with this reality that I'm a transportation organization. I'm starting to play in a space that is not transportation. And I need to keep this thing going because it's clearly something that's resonating. So we officially stood it up in December as a 501c3. So we're in the nonprofit world now, um, with, but it's allowed us now to go ahead and venture into these really amazing use cases that are finding their way to our plate. And so our, our, our first effort right out of the door, we couldn't even have our first meeting to do bylaws and articles of incorporation. And we're already sitting here learning of our new friend, David Garfunkel, who I didn't know before December. Um, and now we're sitting here with David and Miller Electric and the city of Jacksonville and JEA um, and, and others, JTA is part of that, uh, applying for a National Science Foundation grant that we expect to hear hopefully in the next week or so that would deploy broadband in Eastside Jacksonville. So I saw in the chat, uh, Betsy was asking a question about that underserved without web access and information to the things we were talking about. This is inherently the backbone of today's society. So, so we are going for that grant. I think the uniqueness of Smart North Florida is we're very neutral. There's nothing exactly vested from an SNF perspective uh, was what we call it for sure. So our ability to fill a room with people and get them to talk, our ability to access potentially these grants, draw in unique partners that maybe not are not in this lane per se, is what we're finding um, to be the real benefit. And that's where we'll draw on that app I talked about. And Anne Marie even expressed it in a larger scale. I mentioned it just from the notion of somebody has the ability to access transportation. Well, let's imagine now that patient, like she said, had diabetes, has to have a certain dietary aspect, has to go to the doctor every Thursday and all those elements. What if a single environment allowed that patient, if willing, because I understand the HIPAA challenges, if willing is opting into the environment and therefore all of those services are reaching out to that patient instead of the patient reaching out to all those services. And we can challenge the entrepreneurial and startup sector in that space the value proposition to them is solving the issue, creating the byproduct that they can now market and sell. And therefore we've created additional business opportunity with it as well. And the last piece I'll say that I've learned in these engagements, whether it's been LISC or others reaching out to me, again, organizations not typical for me to spend time with, you know, is, is even the other spin to that. In these underserved communities, really, really smart people, a lot of intellectual capital and startup and entrepreneurs as well. But all the challenges keep them from having access. This kind of a space with entrepreneurial challenges, UNF's Entrepreneurial Center and Access, they can be as much a part of the solution of creating that app or that product and then have the resource to support and grow that to market and develop their own business. And frankly, they didn't need to drive anywhere. And that's one of the things that you see even in the prospects of just growing and creating um, wealth in theory for some of those folks in the underserved. So it's a, it's a big story. It's a big initiative that's, that's really just continuing um, to, to, to move forward. But, um, but it's an amazing ride to, to be able to do this. I'm born and raised in Jacksonville, um, you know, and I know all of these problems happen and are going on in my community. But I've been 28 years sitting right there in the lane of funding roads and funding transportation, because that's what I do. And, and, and now the ability to really see and, and understand this, it, it's, it's so incredible to kind of have landed on something that seems to connect in all spaces. And then let's face it, I can always draw back in Kelly and I in the transportation piece, because the bottom line is somehow it still always ties to everything. Uh, in the end. So we can find our niche, but still have this initiative to bring everything together. Thanks, Jeff. You had mentioned, you know, just meeting David, you had also mentioned um, the breaking down of silos and bringing, uh, you know, private businesses with not-for-profit and, and reaching into different, uh, different areas. 
Um, David, that sounds like a lot of what Lift Jacks is, is all about with the, the four pillars. Um, can you dive in? I know some people have, have joined us before with some conversations with Lift Jacks, but can you get into that? But then, I mean, all of it sort of ties together with the, with the idea of trying to eradicate poverty and these barriers to healthcare, right? That's right. Um, yeah, that's a, a helpful lead in. And, and then I want to tie back to something that Jeff was mentioning too about the assets that are uh, in these communities that are under leveraged from a city perspective. Um, but briefly on Lift Jacks, which is an initiative of business leaders partnering with community leaders, partnering with residents uh, in the neighborhood in a community revitalization effort with the ultimate mission of eradicating poverty. Uh, we're focused in the east side and we're using a model that is called purpose-built communities. And purpose-built communities is a proven model for community revitalization, for breaking that cycle of poverty. And the four pillars of that model are represented on uh, this call. And from many of the, from the folks who have spoken and from many of you who um, maybe haven't spoken yet, but you are represented in, uh, in these pillars. And the four that we talk about are one, mixed income housing. So affordable, uh, quality affordable housing, market rate housing, uh, just quality housing across the board in the neighborhood. The second pillar is cradle to career education. That's not necessarily something we've talked about a lot today, um, but we have on other panels. And this is a, a fundamental, uh, fundamentally important part of the model is having excellent educational opportunities from the, the pre-K babies all the way up through college and career. The third is community wellness, which um, is uh, a broad category that is probably most easily described as the social determinants of health outside of maybe housing, but uh, access to parks and green spaces, access to healthy food, public safety, uh, a healthy, vibrant uh, built environment, and finally, long-term financial vitality. So uh, supporting entrepreneurs, supporting businesses, uh, families, making sure that the economic development aspect is addressed as well. So it's really the holistic set of those four strategies, all focused in a coordinated way um, that is the purpose-built communities model. And that's what we are bringing to, get, bringing to bear as a collective um, through Lift Jacks, uh, through our partners in the East Side. And um, we're, we're really uh, just getting started in some ways, but I think what I would hope you would hear from that is that it is a holistic set of, of strategies that are required. Uh, no one single organization uh, or one single individual created these issues. And so no one single organization or individual is gonna solve them. And so it's really gonna take all of us to do so and to work together on it. And that's really what we're trying to do with Lift Jacks. But I want to pick up on something that, that Jeff said as well, which is about the intellectual capital, um, all the assets that are in these communities. Um, and I started off, uh, well, I started off by saying place matters. Um, I'm also going to put a second plug out there, and that's that race matters. And there is a uh, correlation across the country, but in this city, between race and place. And as we're talking about disparities, uh, seeing that those disparities uh, disproportionately, uh, the negative disparities disproportionately affect communities of color. But I'm gonna turn this into the reason we should be focused on this, um, not just for because it's the right thing and because it's a moral imperative, but as we sit here uh, as business leaders and others, why this is important uh, from a business perspective as well and just as we do as, as, a, as a city. And a couple uh, timeline and dates for you to kind of plug into your head. In 2012, the majority of babies born in the United States were young children of color in 2012. In 2018, we passed a milestone where the majority of youth in the United States were, were people of color. By 2030, it is projected that the majority of young workers in the United States within the decade will be people of color. And by 2044, the US will be majority people of color. 
and we're expected to hit that milestone around 2050 in Jacksonville. So from a business perspective, these are our future employees, our future employers, consumers, vendors, contractors, business partners, you name it. It's the face of our community and this, the business ecosystem around us and it's changing and that's, that's the trend and that's the trajectory. And that's, uh, that's relevant to all of us in terms of where we're going as a city and as a country. So we need to be supporting and investing communities of color because this is our, this is our future. Um, and where we are today in terms of our present is not uh, necessarily a positive look when it comes to disparities and it's poverty is, is what I look at uh, for my day-to-day -day job. And the poverty rate for African-Americans in Duval County is about 25%, uh, one in four. And for white families, it's around 10 or 11%. And so we have big disparities, um, but communities of color are our future. And we, are, we need to be making the investments uh, in these communities because it's the right thing to be doing, um, but also because uh, this is, I believe, sort of an economic and business imperative for us as well. This is how we are going to be a thriving, vibrant community altogether. Um, so I took us off of health a little bit there, but I wanted to pick up on that piece that, that Jeff said because it really resonated with how I think about this work as just the right thing to do um, for, for so many different reasons. David, I'm, I'm glad you, you, you went there. I mean, obviously at the very beginning, um, Gracie had mentioned that, you know, this has been a series, uh, you know, race as it applies to certain things. This is, this is race as it, as it applies to, to, to health equity. And so I think that's an important thing. I think something else that I think is worth uh, mentioning and maybe, uh, you know, myself as a small business owner, but maybe you can, you know, talk to this, the idea of implicit bias, um, you know, we, we hear that term, and I, I think Anne-Marie may have even touched on this a little bit earlier. Uh, the idea of implicit bias, we all have biases. That's, that's not the problem. Um, but so, something we can do is think about those biases uh, that we have and bring them, you know, from our unconscious mind to our conscious mind to be able to make um, strategic, purposeful changes uh, and realize the, these investments in the community are going to help our overall economic, um, you know, impact. Anne-Marie? Yeah, so, you know, I was thinking about where we started today. And yes, we got heavy in the middle around social determinants. But to bring us back, and David, you did it eloquently, you know, at the center of the problem is racism, whether it's structural, whether it's institutional, whether it's implicit or, or, or explicit bias. When I think about the audience we have right now, um, it looks predominantly small business. So what are you going to do? You know, what can your little organization do in the landscape of improving health equity? Because that's our focus. When Gracie and I met, she said, okay, Anne-Marie, we have to acknowledge the problem. We need to raise awareness, create aspirations, and build action into accomplishment. I, get, I think that was my task, right, Gracie? So if you look at this slide, I really think this kind of summarizes a little bit of it. As an organization, be self-reflective. Take the time, stop checking out the next guy or gal organization, and look at your policies and procedures. What are you doing that are creating disparities or inequities in your team? What does your team look like? What does your leadership look like? I heard someone um, brag about their leadership team was nice and diverse. All right, that's great. But if I go to your third level manager, am I seeing diversity there? Just because you fixed it at the top, did you fix it at the third and the fourth level, right? Um, what are you doing in the community to do your part, whether it's jumping on board and supporting Lift Jacks is working on or coming over to my food pharmacy and volunteering and looking in the face of um, our fellow citizens and residents and saying, I respect you and I want to see you succeed. What can you do in your own space of empowerment and control to contribute to health equity? It is not all about lift jacks or any of the hospitals represented or JTA or ability housing. It is not on our back. 
It is on our back as a community. And if you remember what I said in the beginning, the problem with inequities is that we lose out on talent. So we could have someone sitting in a community who is restricted based on income, based on education, who could be the one that Jeff needs to develop that app. And we have not given them the opportunity to get to him. So this is where I would leave you in my, my little thoughts is, what are you doing to measure the inequities that you're contributing to? Because if you think you aren't, contact me later and I'll help you off that little um, fallacy you have to make sure you know. We are all contributing to the problem by some way, um, but it's all time for us now to really address and jump into the issue so we can be equitable and really create what Jack's Chamber always talks about, right? A great place where we can live, work and play. We all win if we take that approach. Thanks, Dan Marie. You know, we are starting to get uh, a little bit into this. So I, I, I would like to get to the question piece. And uh, we've had a lot of questions come through. Gracie's been kind enough to uh, get them over to me. And so I'm just going to dive right in and, and I'm hopefully going to assign them <laughs> to the, the, the correct person. This one uh, right off the bat is very, is pretty easy. The Shannon, this one's going to be for you. Is, is there a percentage or amount of affordable housing you would like to see built or offered to change the dynamic of, of a specific community or Jacksonville as a whole? Uh, it, what's the scope of this? Sure. So um, I think it's I, I think we all started this with the understanding that race underlie everything that we were talking about. But I really appreciate really stating it. And um I would, so there's some basic numbers that are sometimes daunting, but then you realize these are numbers we can tackle. Every year, the nonprofits get together and we try to identify how many people are homeless on any given day. And this is the HUD definition of homeless, literally on our streets. And so last year, when we did the count, we found 1,665 people living on our streets on one day in January. Of them, 301 were chronically homeless. So that means they have a disability and have been living on the streets for a very long time. Um, in addition, our public schools try to identify any students who are homeless or unstably housed. So couch surfing or living in a motel or something like that. And last year, our public schools identified 3,770 students who are homeless or unstably housed. And those are families that if they're not literally homeless now are on the brink of becoming homeless. So, and of course, those are just the students we found and we're able to identify and they have younger siblings who might not be in the school system yet or older siblings who might be out of school but are still unstably housed. So they're big numbers, but they're doable numbers. We can tackle those kinds of numbers. Um, I, I also think in this, I think one of the things that maybe people don't necessarily understand is how integral housing policy has been to creating this problem. If anybody really wants to understand this, you need to get a book called The Color of Law. And it explains how our federal government created segregated neighborhoods, created the loss of intergenerational wealth because they created intentional policies that made it harder for African-Americans to purchase a home and made those homes that they did purchase less valuable, period. You do that in the 1940s, Generations later, the growth of wealth and assets that uh, white families had compared to African-American families is a, one of the core reasons we have such a disparity between the wealth and assets of um, African-Americans, Blacks, compared to whites. But also it's why they live in neighborhoods that have more negative things because if you have less influence, that's where the energy plant's gonna go or that's where the train's gonna go or that's where they're gonna you know, put the highway through your neighborhood and all those things that have negative impacts on the quality of life and ultimately the health outcomes is a direct result of intentional federal policy in the 30s and 40s. So um, I think you, you need to understand how things got happened so you can help create the solutions to counter them. And so I do encourage people to, uh, if you really wanna understand how we got to this point, it took us a long time to get here. We're not gonna fix it overnight but it was very educational to me to learn how much housing policy actually created this challenge. Thank you, Shannon. Um, next question, I'm gonna bundle a couple of them here together. So I'll let a couple different people jump in, um, but with JTA, with Ride Opportunities, et cetera, uh, how are we getting information out to patients? Is it, is it phone, is it text, is it email? Um, 
somebody here has a, a statistic that 80% of Americans ha have text enabled uh, phones, SMS read rate around 98% and response rate extraordinarily quickly. So in, in terms of transportation, how we're getting this information out about uh, ride shares. And then do we have a way to implement the ability to, on the health um, provider side, text patients or their advocates uh, for patient engagement? Yes, yeah, so I think I can take the first stab at this. Um, you know, relative to the Ride to Health campaign, um, obviously we partnered um, with several of the news agencies to get that information out to the public in general. Um, Anne Marie and I will be having um, numerous, I'm sure, conversations as it relates to directly linking patients. And so that's another lane. So when we talk about more of the general um, communication to access, there's also an, an intentional communication that goes to patients directly. And so I think that there's some definite synergies there. Um, but really, it, like I've mentioned, that's through all of the different social media sites, through um, you know, um, the television stations, through our efforts in terms of educating through our community outreach, um, through the community partnerships, through the CPACs. Um, uh, you know, throughout the um, communities, the six different CPACs, I'm engaged with my outreach team that goes out and educates. So we're pushing that message in as many directions as we can. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I want to try to kind of keep with this um, sort of technology uh, sort of, of, of theme. So Jeff, you might want to jump in on this. Uh, to Jeff's point of, uh, about one source of patient data, I would like to hear a plan of how to accomplish this. Uh, being in healthcare, uh, IT, uh, unfortunately, the likely, you know, I know the likelihood of um, this shared uh, electronic medical record system is, is relatively or very low. What um, you had mentioned, an opt-in type of thing, is, is that a reality? It's a reality in other countries. When you look at some that are more advanced in the smart city space and they've empowered their residents to be part of the community, something as simple as even their ability when they're walking on the street and they see a, a crack in the sidewalk, they don't even initiate a call to the public works department. They actually initiate the service call uh, with it empowered in their hands. So, I mean, there are examples across the country um, that that in this scenario of, and why I'm saying the term opt-in, because in all these cases, obviously there's the sharing of information that may or may not be of a personal nature. So I think the, the first cut there isn't about this population, populating all personal health information somewhere. This is about individuals that in theory, uh, if they wish to, would be opting into this potential app or solution and therefore have agreed to share the needs that they have. Um, that's, that's what we see across the, the world in terms of in areas that are empowering citizens to be part of it. I, I won't even pretend to understand all the dynamics of the HIPAA challenges and, and that sort of thing. What, what, what I see from this larger initiative is to, to push the limits, the, the big ideas, the big challenges, what are the community aspects? Uh, does our initiative introduce uh, interesting creators and others to think about things differently. And then the challenge of implementation is, is the harder lift, but at the end, can we get a creative type of solution that we didn't otherwise initially contemplate? What, what I've seen, whether it's public sector, whether it's anything that we do, we're, we're so guilty of a mission, and no offense to any attorneys, but on the call, but we always ask our attorneys the first question. And if it's a problem, then we don't even look to solve the issue. And, and I think that the paradigm shift, even under kind of this, this entrepreneurial culture that we're, this ecosystem that, that we're developing, it's asking the first question first, solve the problem, and then we'll worry about whether or not we can pull it off. And, and, and we get then to a potential solution. So I'm not saying it's there now, that's a very fair question. That, that's what we're trying uh, to, to create is that, that ecosystem that allows for that kind of thing to happen. Jeff, I, I want to go ahead, Amory. Go um, ahead. 
you know, Jeff is spot on. The, the hospital folks on the line are all cringing with me, right? Because we, we're stuck in this HIPAA world where, you know, we can't share data and so forth. But I will say, if you look around the nation around grants right now that are focused on equity and access and so forth, there is opportunity that we can pursue this type of work under a research umbrella that would protect us, so to speak, to try new things. So I think we just have to be really intentional and you know, beat down all the grant opportunities out there so we can jump into it. Unfortunately, yes, we're, we're restricted, but I, I, I don't wanna leave with the perception that we can't get there and try to experiment this. You know, I'm, I'm, I, I'm all about going rogue a little bit, just don't tell Dr. Haley, but we gotta be creative. And that's, I think what Jeff is getting at is that we know the, the restrictions we have, but what are the workarounds that we can sell to some entity to convince them to support Jacksonville in this work? And my last quick thought is I'm looking at David right now. Well, while David is gonna be, I think, what's that? Lift Jacks is three miles maybe from the hospital and I am a member of Lift Jacks. Please know that he and I are not in competition for the work in the community, right? United Way has their footprint in the community. My colleagues at Baptist and St. Vincent's and Mayo Clinic, everybody's in the community. So while we may be celebrating and sharing some new things right now, be focused on the team, not one element of the team. We're all doing good work and we just need to leverage each other, help each other and elevate the work collectively to improve our city as a whole. Thanks, Emory. I want to actually, we just talked a lot about the technology and, and how to, you know, make that work. But many of our underserved don't have access to the web. I know Jeff talked about uh, broadband to the east side. Um, but what do we do to get, um, you know, that information, you know, how do we, those underserved areas? And has a communication system been considered to use uh, for people who don't just don't have access to that technology? Well, I'll jump in with something that actually Anne-Marie and I have talked about, which is, again, it's cross-sector. You know, our residents are low income. How can we help them have access to healthcare, whether it's virtual and the healthcare is coming to them, mobile clinics and the healthcare is coming to them, but also us providing Wi-Fi and a Wi-Fi cafe with laptops or tablets that they can borrow so they can go online and access things. How can we look at what we have, what the relationship we have and the sectors that we intersect with and the people we're serving intersect with and break down those barriers. It's, you know, I, I should be more than just housing. Everybody should be more than just the thing they are. We should be what we are in partnership with everything else. Then I'll, I'll add just in the example of Eastside Jacks, if we were to get this grant, there's two elements to it that's different too. The notion of Wi-Fi is inherently to one of the problems because when you think about you move around, every time you move, you lose that signal and you hopefully pick up another Wi-Fi router. And that's the kind of thing too that creates a problem. One of the things if awarded the grant in Eastside Jacks is to test actually a cellular LTE network laying over that community. So cellular based with a much larger coverage area, uh, less, higher dependency, and, and the reality of, of creating uh, a network in a, in a new spectrum within the LTE environment that's specifically for providing these, these types of services. So the intent would be a proof of concept within that community. Uh, from a device perspective, uh, Duval Schools is part of the, the partnership with this effort. Um, the ability already from the analytics platform to understand all the students that are in that community all of them which have Duval County School laptops and hotspots at the moment, we have the ability and the metrics already. So when we develop this LTE network, we can swap the dongles for each one of those students and understand whether or not this type of a system is improving their connectivity uh, and creating better opportunity for them to thrive. The secondary piece to that is the heavier lift. How do we ensure devices for the rest of the residents in that community and engage them in this pilot effort to allow it to happen? Because at the end of the day, it is access, but we talk about all of the elements David was talking about, access to food and healthcare and all those things. The truth is if they had good solid access to the internet now, 
that healthy food can just drive to them to their front door. We're all doing it now. And, and so it's just the ability to connect them now to the world has tremendous opportunity. I know there's still cost challenges to a lot of it and that sort of thing. But, but with all due respect to that, the idea of that network we're talking about becomes a public utility. So the notion of actually having to purchase your internet access would be gone. It would be just public access to the environment. So uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity um, with how we might connect them. Thanks, Jeff. Hey, uh, we are starting to run up against time and I, I do apologize for that, but I do have one more uh, question that I want to get to and then uh, sort of a final question for everybody. Uh, and then we'll be able to get this uh, wrapped up. And so um, this is from uh, Nicole. I've been reading a lot about the concept of blue zones. I'm curious how to create a balance, not only creating access, but also education and cultural preservation. For example, in underserved communities, what else goes into making sure our neighbors can live a longer, healthy life beyond putting a Publix in there? Uh, how do we educate on food and wellness without whitewashing and also empowering people to make their health a priority? Who'd like to tackle that one? I'll jump. Um, <laughs> <laughs> God bless so, you. I, yeah. I think the answer is kind of the same answer. It's not any one of us. It's all of us figuring right. out how we do, what is our role in doing that? So one of the things that Ability Housing that we've uh, started really leaning in on is our role is a landlord, but we have really close relationships with our tenants. What are the things we can do using those relationships to help make connections to really break intergenerational poverty among our residents? How can we have it so that the children living in our apartments do not need subsidized housing when they are an adult? What it, and not that we're gonna do things, we're gonna help them access and give them help them use the housing as a platform. And I just share that as an example of look outside the box of your direct role and how can you do things slightly differently? Because again, no one person or entity created this. No one person or entity is gonna fix this. We all have to start thinking differently about how we can tackle this and work together to do it. I'll, I'll, I'll follow on on that jump because I mean, I that's exactly right. And the, the key component as we start to think about how to um, get in with community, which is a part of what I heard from that question, is to have community at the table, to have residents and neighborhood leaders driving this along, driving it, and we support. Um, and it's uh, it being an authentic relationship with people who understand their neighborhoods and communities and neighbors better than, for example, I ever could and partnering with them. So that I think is just the other kind of add I would onto that. Thanks, David. Um, I, I think the final question, and we, we always sort of, sort of end on, on this idea, what, what is the one action our attendees um, can implement today? What can, we, what can we implement today as we walk away from this meeting? And that's uh, open to everybody. What's one thing? Hire from the neighborhoods they were talking about. I would also say, I think there's a, in the neighborhoods that we're talking about, there's a lot of entrepreneurship but they don't necessarily have access to capital or even how to develop a business plan, a simple business plan. Mentor, you know, you, you are small business owners. You've learned a lot of lessons. Just help somebody else learn from your lessons. There are a lot of smart people who want to do a lot of good things. So mine would be a little bit of what I said earlier. Check yourself. Make sure that while you think you're being open and embracing of difference, that your policies and your business, your reach is um, community-wide, not neighborhood-wide. So just check and make sure that your business is really offering its services and access to our entire community and that you hire, of course, our entire community. And including vendor selection. 
Oh, supplier diversity. It's a whole nother topic for another day. Absolutely. Kelly, Jeff? I have yeah, a silly I mean, one. Never turn down a meeting. And the reason I say that, what I've learned in the last two years with the interesting folks that have found their way into my space that have zero on paper to do with us, or we should never be having a conversation after about an hour of talking with, you can only imagine the folks that have found their way in here right now, having a chat with them, you find a commonality anymore in today's modern world. And I think inherently that's what's happened with, with us is, is this realization every time there is a, a it is, I don't know how to say it, the solution anymore has become so normalized. We are all trying using um, creative ideas and entrepreneurialism and data and analytics and predictive measures and performance measures. It doesn't matter the sector. And so we all end up at the same place, trying to solve it the same way. Um, just put just put sector here. It's the same thing. So never turn down a meeting anymore because Thank there's you. a value that comes out of it that um, that you just simply don't see on paper. Thanks, Jeff Kelly. So I think there's a benefit in going last. So I can say that my colleagues have covered. Um, <laughs> All of which I would say, but I would also just, I'll add one thing. Uh, I would say educate yourself, you know, be mindful, um, get the information, and then use that education and information to disperse and, and collaborate with others. Thank and I'll, you. I'll add one last one to me and more from all of us. Yes. And I will say, demand more of yourselves. You know, I, I demand more of myself. I try to demand more of myself. All of us on the call, let's ask ourselves what we can do to help and demand more of, of, of ourselves. And with that, I'm going to thank all of you um, for letting me moderate and hand this back over uh, to our fearless leader, Gracie Simmendinger. Hi, um, wow. I'm. I'm nearly speechless. I also want to re-listen to the recording. I'm so glad the panelists allowed us to do that, but I constantly learn from all these conversations and become more aware and really feel activated by this knowledge to do more and to be more. And so I just thank all of the panelists here to help lead this conversation. And again, give a huge shout out to Anne-Marie for just, wow. I, I cannot thank you enough for all of your work to make this possible. Um, as I mentioned earlier, this is the third iteration of conversations on race and specific topics. So following this meeting, um, perhaps tomorrow you'll be receiving a post-event survey. Give us your feedback. What do you want to hear next? What panelists are we missing? How do you want to be engaged? What does that look like? We uh, definitely want to hear from you and provide content that is relevant to you and, and what you what you want to hear. So um, please give us some feedback on that. Um, the downtown council meets on the first and third Friday of every month via Zoom. I'm going to post the link in the uh, chat right now for you to sign up for our next meeting next Friday. It's going to be with Nate Monroe with the Florida Times Union and Obi Umina with Umina Legal Group to talk about how important local journalism is um, and how that impacts business. So please sign up for that if you're able to join us. I know it's the Friday morning, um, but we'd love to have you. You can also learn more about the Downtown Council at downtowncouncil.org. Um, and that's all I have, but Ben has one more thing he wants to add. So I'm gonna close out and then let him uh, really adjourn the meeting. So Ben, take it away. Thanks, Gracie. I did want to mention there's a lot of really neat things going on uh, in the East Side neighborhood this weekend, as well as over um, off Tailing Rand and Tailgaters parking lot. World of Nations is going on over there. But uh, this Saturday, um, the Melanin Market going on in the East Side neighborhood and Blacknicity on Sunday. Awesome events. If you don't have something to do 
you now have a great thing to do this weekend. Yes, awesome. So thank you again um, for spending your evening with us and learning a little more. Um, and we're just gonna go ahead and adjourn. If you are a panelist, please stay on the call um, for Anne-Marie's uh, request.